I'm delighted to be here. It's fantastic for those of us who have been working with IPv6 for a while, in my case 20 years, um, to see so many of you interested. <laughs> Somebody's laughing. <laughs> it's been 20 years of joy. <laughs> 20 years of joy, not a dull moment. To see so many of you here showing the great interest that there is in, in IPv6 now. So what I want to do is give you the world's fastest whirlwind tour of the basics of IPv6 fundamentals. And Dave, yes, we can do this in an hour. Um, <laughs> well, I'm timing you. <laughs> oh, rats. Uh, that clock's wrong, right? <laughs> I've got 60 minutes. And we've got lunch. Veronica mentioned I could go right into lunch and you wouldn't mind. <laughs> anyway, um, we've provided IPv6 security services for a whole uh, training and consulting for a whole host of companies down the years, including a number that I can't mention, but many well-known ones, for example, Arbor Networks and, and Sophos. So what I want to do is to first of all clear up some misconceptions that you will find useful, even if they're obvious to you, in arguing the need for V6 security with your colleagues. And then I want to give you a feel for the size of the vulnerability surface, that blancmange that we're all worrying about. And then I'm going to give you the world's fastest introduction to the features that are built into IPv6 services to provide security. And I loved your slide, Richard, because 10 Point 10 was that adding security features compromises security or makes it more of a challenge by complicating things. And then I'll give you one slide on the future. So, why are we here? Well, the reason we're here is IPv6 is taking off. If you get a dual stack service from your provider today, and if you don't go out and change provider, then you will find that 75% you, of your traffic goes over IPv6. And this is doubling. The number of users of V6 are doubling every year. So by 2020, everyone will be using IPv6. Um, but the key thing from this is that if we look at our infrastructure today, and particularly if we consider our operating systems, they've been IPv6 for over a decade. So we need to take security seriously. So let's have a look at some misconceptions. There are two really big ones to start with. First one is IPv6 is more secure than IPv4. And the second one is IPv6 is less secure than IPv4. Both of these are wrong. And they're wrong because their fundamental assumption that underpins them is wrong. And that assumption is that you can compare IPv4 security with IPv6 security. It's meaningless. And the reason it is meaningless is because we have IPv6 everywhere. Today, almost all, in fact I could say all, can't I? All network stacks, IP stacks, are IPv6 stacks. They just happen to provide legacy support for that old protocol, IPv4. And so if you have a, an IPv4 network, today it's a V6 network, even though you haven't turned on V6 and you will find V6 traffic on it. So that blamange of security vulnerabilities is your security vulnerabilities that you should be concerned about. Now, misconception number three, and that is, and this applies to security as well, people assume that IPv6 is simply IPv4 with longer addresses. This is so wrong. IPv6 is a new protocol with many new features. Even addresses are massively different. They're different beasties. If you look closely at them, you see they've got different attributes. But not only have they got different attributes, the way that you use them is very different from how you use them in IPv4. They have lifetimes. They're like subatomic particles. They can appear and disappear by magic. In IPv4, you typically have one address on an interface. In IPv6, it's not unusual to have two, common to have three. You can have hundreds or thousands of addresses on a single interface, changing with time by magic. So there are a whole host 
of complexities in something that you might think is simple. This is not good for security. So, let's have a look at the blancmange. But before we do, let's look at why this blancmange has ballooned out. And this, Richard alluded to a lot of this. Let's make it IPv6 specific. First of all, I've mentioned the complexity. V6 is more complex than IPv4. And I'll show you a few examples. Not only that, every stack is a dual stack. So every stack is sharing resources, whether it be compute resources or whether it be memory. So you've now got two sets of routing tables. Not only have you got an ARP cache, you've got a neighbor discovery cache. Not only have you got those, we've got other things like queues and, and other things going on there. And if you can attack one and consume the resources, you may impact the other. Worse than that, the designers of IPv6 have tightly coupled two separate protocols, v4 and v6, together in evil things called transition mechanisms. <laughs> the perfect number of transition mechanisms is no, no. precisely, and that's not the world that we live in. That we live in. It's the world we love, though, because remember, we're professionals. We want it to be complicated. Um, <laughs> now then, and also, of course, the standards are rocket propelled. They're changing. You remember Andrew Tannenbaum's classic book, and if you don't read it every year, I'd recommend it, Computer Networks. In that he says, if you don't like this year's standards, wait for next. And then finally, and this is something that people tend to forget, and that's a human element. You see, our biggest problem, and this has been mentioned by others before, is our human resources. And particularly, not our staff generally, but our administrators. They have been programmed over decades to think in a V4 world. We need to deprogram them. So, I thought I'd worry you by showing you the blancmange, which is the IPv6 vulnerability surface. Don't panic. I just want to give you a little bit of an idea about where you need to concentrate your security considerations. So I've added some meaningless labels. <laughs> and those meaningless labels, remember we can't compare V4 with V6. But I'm just trying to give you an idea about where you need to look. So there are an awful lot of things that are similar or they're the same. And then we have some huge things that are new. So we have things like IPv4. All the vulnerabilities of V4 are there in our dual stacks. Then we have loads of new transition mechanisms, we have new features like mobility, we have some areas that we might think are the same but are not, such as ICMP v6, and then we have some surprisingly large areas of entertainment such as neighbour discovery protocol. So this gives you a little bit of an idea, and what I'm going to do, because I don't have time to go through all of these, that would be several days at least, maybe a few weeks to go in detail, so I'm going to give you some examples. But before we do, don't panic. Remember, this is everywhere now. So you're already in this situation, right? Nothing changes if you deploy IPv6. Well, I'm lying a little bit, but not entirely. But the good news is that defaults today include IPv6 firewalls on by standard, by default. Now, your security professionals, and I see Dave smiling, he knows what I'm going to say, you shouldn't trust that obviously, but it's not as bad as you might think it is. Also, there are a lot of threats that are common between the two protocols, and you should already, of course, be securing against those already. Plus, there are attack vectors that are same in V4 as are in V6, even though the threats might be different. So, for example, I'm sure you've all secured your data links with, say, IEEE 802.1x. Well, if you haven't in v4, why are you complaining about attacks in v6 that come via the data link? Hmm. Okay. So that's just to put things in context. Now, this has already been covered, but I'm going to give you some numbers because we like numbers. So in an IPv6 subnet, there are 64 bits to play with. 
And that gives you 80 million billion. And this isn't one of those tiny American billions. This is a British billion. <laughs> <laughs> this is more molecules than there are in your body. I checked. And if you want to scan this with gigabit ethernet, when there's no other traffic, it will take you half a million years. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I did. And I'm not kidding. This is fun, right? We love numbers. And this will make a lot of people happy. So scanning IPv6 subnets is impossible. In IPv4, that's an IPv4 subnet scanned. In IPv6, it's difficult. But it isn't as difficult as you might think. So there are ways of scanning subnets that overcome these problems. I think Fernando is going to talk about some of this. Excellent. But let me give you a silly example, right? We have a customer, I won't name them, they might even be here, which would be even worse. <laughs> and before we went to be involved with them, they decided on their IPv6 address plan to use V4 addresses in the bottom 32 bits of the interface identifier. So suddenly the scanning problem, right, goes from a V6 space, which is huge, to a V4 space. A really bad idea, not just for that reason, but for lots of other reasons. Here's something, so scanning's good, but here's something a lot of people assume makes V6 much worse. And that is the lack of network address translation. So we have in V4, pretty much every part of the internet is broken with NAT and CGN. But in IPv6, that brokenness is gone. Now, a few years ago, I built a house in the Highlands of Scotland next to a beautiful sea lot. And when it was built, the front door wouldn't open. Now, my NAT believer friend, Phil, he said to me, David, and this is true, he said, David, this is great, your house is secure. But I said, hang on a moment, I actually want to go into my house, right? <laughs> He said, that's no problem, Dave, that's no problem. Look, there's a window open up there, and you've got a ladder so you can get in. That is the mentality of NAT believers. I tried really hard to persuade him that a key and a lock was a good idea, but he wouldn't have it. Anyway, so as security professionals, we need to take this seriously, of course, and that is in IPv6, we need to have firewalls everywhere and verify that they're on and doing what we expect. Now, a beautiful thing in IPv6 is the simplicity in the IPv6 header. It's been streamlined to be like a super fast sports car. It's a thing of beauty. And we've got rid of all that nonsense with checksums, fragmentation fields, and all those horrible options that made the header vary in size. So this is good, right? No, because in IPv6, they just wanted to make it extendable and flexible. And to do that, the options were moved into a range of what we call extension headers. And so if we want to do, uh, say, hop by hop header, rather than having a transport header after our IPv6 header, we have the hop by hop header, and then we have the transport layer. If we want to do fragmentation, we add in another header for fragmentation. And all of these headers are fiendishly complicated. So as a, from an attacker's perspective, they're going, <laughs> right, this is great. There's all sorts of rules about these headers which they can break. But for us as professionals interested in securing our networks, this is job security. <laughs> now, the headers, the hop by hop headers and destination headers, are examples of headers that have subheaders, little baby headers, little options that live inside that are also variable and extendable. This is a huge problem. Let's look at some of the things evil people could do, and I'm sure there's none of them here. Um, if a header should appear once, let's put it in more than once. If a header should appear at most twice, let's put it in more than twice. If a header should appear at the end of the chain, let's add headers after that. So attackers have got a rich field of pickings for seeing if they can subvert your network. Worse, they can create header chains that are difficult to pass in your firewalls and in your intrusion detection systems. Particularly if you're doing detection in hardware, it becomes impossible to pass all the potential 
combinations. So that's a problem. Here's another one. In IPv4, ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol, is trivial. There are an awful lot of firewall administrators who, IPv4 firewall administrators, who simply block it. In IPv6, ICMP has become much bigger. It's actually great because it brings together all sorts of different protocols and new functionality into one consistent structure, ICMPv6. All these things. Bad news is, many of them you actually need in order to make IPv6 work. You can't simply block them. Worse, some of them have to traverse firewalls. So not only can you not block them, but they have to traverse firewalls. Hmm. So if you look at their packet too big in IPv6, fragmentation's done at the source. So you have to have a working path MTU discovery. Path um, maximum transmission unit discovery. Well, to do that, they need to traverse uh, routers. Hmm, not so good. So this makes you, as security professionals, have to make decisions about which of these you block where in your network, because it's not the same everywhere. I have views on this, but we don't have time. Let's just bury into one tiny little bit of ICMPv6, and that's the name of Discovery Protocol. This does lots of things, and the two big things are stateless address auto configuration, Slack, and this is the magic that when you turn on an IPv6 machine, it automatically configures with uh, addresses and with routing, if you have a router, and with other things like DNS. And then we also have the equivalent of ARP, but it's not the same in address resolution. So we have all sorts of threats. Let me show you two. Here's the one that a lot of people worry about. And this is a trivial threat. There is a single message called a router advertisement that's a part of state's address auto configuration that is used to configure a node with addresses, with default routes, with other parameters as well, such as DNS. And so if an attacker sends out a fake router advertisement to a node, it will be configured with whatever that attacker wants it to be configured with. This is bad. Let me tell you a story. I know a guy who was speaking at the Storage Developers Conference in Santa Clara a few years ago on IPv6 for software developers in storage networks. And he configured their plug fest. You know, all the usual suspects were there, EMC, Sun, Microsoft, and all the rest of them. He, I had the flu. He <laughs> had the flu, and he made a mistake. <laughs> Oops, I slipped up. Okay, you know it was me. Anyway, I put in the wrong default router. So there's this big room, this plug fest going on, and I just black holed the IPv6 traffic, and everything stopped working. And one of my friends from the Samba team, Simo, he came over and said, David, I think you might have failed up on v6. And I went, <coughs> excuse me, I'm dying. The good news is that with v6 is that you can fix things like this quickly, so I sent out a router advertisement that deprecated my mistake and put things right. But it's not just attackers, it's your own staff that can make mistakes. So this risk is not just about evil people, it's about the, <laughs> the good guys. Here's another example with neighbour discovery, and you can do remote attacks. Now I suspect Fernando and us will talk about this, but just briefly, because there are so many addresses in this subnet, if an attacker sends messages to those addresses, even if they're not in use, this router has to do neighbour discovery to find the MAC address of each of those nodes. It consumes resources in something called the neighbour cache. Oops, that's a mistake. Um, with incomplete records, it might even queue the packet. Worse, each message coming here will generate by default, three neighbour solicitations. So you're doing an amplification attack. Hmm, that's a problem. Now, I mentioned transition mechanisms. There's no such thing as a good transition mechanism. Unfortunately, 
you may be forced to use them sometimes. Worse, <laughs> others are using them legitimately for things that are not evil. For example, Microsoft Direct Access will use Torito and 6 to 4 to gain IPv6 connectivity back to its servers. And that's legitimate. Um, most of them don't have security built in. They're all fiendishly complicated. They were invented by people I know and love who did this for the glory of it at the IETF. Um, <laughs> to get your name in print. So there are about 30 of these, and they tie together IPv4 and IPv6. So let's miss that one, but let's just do this one. Torito. I love Torito. Or as Hurricane Electric had it on their IPv6 Guru T-shirts. Does anybody know? Torado. <laughs> anyway. Um, and you see, from an attacker's perspective, this is wonderful. It's built into Windows. It's built into many platforms as standard. And it, it's a mechanism for getting through NAT and firewalls. So if you're on an in intranet and you want to use the IPv6 int internet, then it uses UDP to get through your NAT to some devices called Torito servers and relays. And it allows two-way IPv6 unimpeded traffic through your NAT device. Oh, by the way, notice, if you look in the address, not only is it the protocols that are coupled, but even the addresses have got fields containing addresses. So you can recognize that that right-hand 32 bits is actually the external address of the NAT box with each bit flipped, right? You can see that. Um, and the port number is the port number flipped. Why is it flipped? Anyone know? <laughs> it's because NAT's evil, right? <laughs> there are many NAT boxes that if they see that combination, even though they don't understand IPv6, they'll change it, right? They'll map it. <laughs> it's dreadful. So this is a wonderful provision for command and control of attacks. It's a way of creating tunnels, if you wish, with V6 and V4 inside them, so you can attack V6 and V4. I could go on. Remember, there's almost 30 of these. <laughs> and they're all complicated. And you can't eliminate them all. Either because you have to receive the traffic, or because you need to use them. Now, so far, I've talked about network layer problems. It isn't just about the network layer. If we go up to higher layers, and I know that this has already been mentioned by Dave or alluded to DNS, but not just DNS, applications are being impacted by changes in IPv6. There are a number of applications, most notably email, SMTP, that use IPv6 address reputation. This is a problem. In V4, this is trivial. In V4, you have 4 billion addresses. If you have a reverse DNS block blacklist, right, block list, then you can put all of the addresses into that, no problem. In fact, I think about half of the addresses are actually in there today, and I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm actually serious. So that's, that's doable. With IPv6, it's completely not doable. Not only is it not doable for each individual node address, but even if you decide to do it by subnets, it's an intractable problem. Because there are way too many slash 64s. Strangely, there's the same number of slash 64s as there are node addresses within a slash 64. I wonder why that is. So 18 million <laughs> <laughs> billion. And then we have a number of slash 48s. It's still quite a big number, 281 billion. And then we have the number of slash 32s. Now, the, the bright ones amongst you, which probably all of you will have realized, that this isn't as simple as that. You can actually make this a smaller problem, because one of the beauties of IPv6 is we know what address prefixes have been allocated by IANA and the regional registrars. And so we know what's been allocated, so we can make this a smaller problem. It's still too big. And, and you know, right? You, yep, you know all about this. 
In IPv4 for email, when a mail server receives an email, it does a whole host of anti-spam checks. And usually they're weighted, depending on how important they are, and one is the IP address reputation. You wouldn't reject an email just on that. You would do a Bayesian calculation of all of these different things, right? But in IPv6, some who are trying to resolve this difficulty that they don't have IP address reputation information for IPv6 have decided to mandate the use of SPF or DKIM on the sending MTA. And if you don't have that, the mail will be dropped. Now that's okay if the rejection is temporary, right? Because it could be delivered later. And that's similar to what we call grey listing. But if it's permanent, and I won't name an organisation that does this, just to say, let's call them Office 366, for example. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a permanent drop. And so that means if you, IPv6 on Office 366, try and get this right, um, SMTP port is, um, is not enabled for, by default for this reason. Because what email administrator will want to guarantee that some legitimate email will be dropped? Hmm. The other problem is, does anybody here use clouded virtual environments? Cloud and virtual, have you ever come across that? Where you're sharing your, your tenant? Nobody, okay? Ah, I just realised where I am. Yes, this is a security event. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. But let's pretend you are, or your customers are, Depending on which environment you're in, you might be sharing a slash 64 with others. Now, IPv6 address reputation is being used. It's typically at the slash 48, which means if you're in a slash 64 with someone else, or even if you're in a slash 56 with someone else, your reputation is tied to them. And this is rather like where I live. I don't want my reputation linked with my neighbours. I live in the Highlands, so we have sheep rustlers, poachers, and other things I won't mention. So, that's just a little bit of an introduction to where the problems lie. Let's look at what's been built into IPv6 to help us address some of these issues. First of all, this is the one that people think of when they think IPv6 is more secure than IPv4. That's IPsec. And this is a misconception, and that is people read the standard and saw the word mandatory. What they didn't spot was that it wasn't mandatory to use. It was mandatory to be in the stack. Well, we have it in IPv4, right? Because they're dual stacks, so they're a bit of IPv6. So there's no difference between IPv4 and IPv6. Would you agree? Well, not in the technology, but in the way that you use it. And the reason there's a difference there is because of the two modes, transport mode and tunnel mode. Transport mode is where each individual packet is secured with either an AH, an ESP, or both header. Tunnel mode is where you put your packet inside a tunnel and secure the tunnel. And that's what most of us are used to. If you use VPNs, IPsec VPNs, that's what's happening. And the reason that we use this in the IPv4 world so much is because of NAT. NAT breaks IPsec transport mode. Well, actually, if you send a tunnel through, it'll break that as well, but it breaks IPsec transport mode because it's evil. So, the difference between v4 and v6 here is that in IPv6 it becomes possible to use transport mode IPsec. Indeed, direct access that I mentioned does that. And we have clients that have got rid of their VPN concentrators and replaced it with direct access. I could work for Microsoft. That was a marketing moment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe not for my earlier comments. Another problem with V6 that there's a solution for is that in the early standard, the interface identifier, the bottom 64 bits, was linked to the MAC address of your notes. Who here would like to advertise their MAC address to the whole of the global internet as your traffic passes over there, right? There are people, that's excellent. I, one, I use plural, there's one person. That's unusual, we'll talk later. 
<laughs> so privacy addresses were invented. These were an additional address that you could use when you were connecting out to a web server or something. And these ad additional addresses are random. And they're temporary. So you throw them away after a period of time, say every day. So Windows has these. It doesn't call them privacy addresses, it calls them temporary addresses. But they are privacy addresses. But that leaves you with your MAC address and your permanent address that you might use for, say, if you're running a web server on your machine. Now, you might still not want to tell people your MAC address. You don't want to tell people your MAC address. So now we have something called opaque static addresses. And these provide a random identifier for long-lived interface identifiers. And the recommendation today is to use these. And we have the expert on these here today. Now, there's another form of addresses, which I'm not going to talk about much. But quickly, they're called cryptographically generated addresses. And these solve a specific problem. And that is where you want to be sure that nobody's using your IPv6 address to do something naughty. So they're not able to spoof your address. And CGA stop the non-owner of an address spoofing it. And the way they do that is this. You link the public key, the public and private key, so this node's got a public and private key, and you link its public key to the CGA. And that means you know that that node, by looking at CGA, that it owns a particular public key. And then if you sign the messages, you also know that the messages are from that node. Yeah? Sounds great. Hmm. And this is a part of something called Secure Neighbor Discovery, SEND. And SEND uses CGAs, and it also uses new neighbor discovery options. So I forgot to mention that. There's lots of options in Neighbor Discovery as well. The extendability is wonderful. Uh, remember the job security part of this. So that allows you to sign these messages. And this can be part of a public key infrastructure, or you can tie the keys to a trust anchor, which is usually in one of your routers, and then you create a hierarchy. I can't go into the details. The main problem you have with this is it's not implemented in most of the major operating systems. <coughs> hmm. And if it is, you have to buy a third-party product. It's a problem. However, you will find it in routers from the major vendors and in switches. So that leaves us with a problem. How do we secure the LAN infrastructure? How do we secure neighbor discovery if we can't use SEND because it's not available? Well, the good news is we can build protection into our LAN infrastructure. And there are a number of common techniques such as RA Guard, DHCP v6 Shield, Neighbor Discovery Inspection and MLD Snooping that is built into switches and that verifies that the packets are correct or are coming from authorised sources. So do you remember the rogue router advertisement problem? What root RA Guard does is it looks at the router advertisement, checks that it's coming in from a valid router, and there's a number of ways it can do that, one of which is to use send. So this is a place where you could use send. So it verifies the router advertisement is from an authorised router and that it's correct, and uh, only allows it through if it passes those tests. So an unauthorised rogue router is blocked, the port will be blocked, plus you will get an alert. And the same is true with DHCP v6 Shield. Neighbour discovery inspection, and there's not just neighbour discovery inspection, that's actually a particular name for a particular product, but there are a number of different systems that do the same thing. And that is they inspect the neighbour solicitations and neighbour advertisements that do the mapping between the v6 addresses and the MAC addresses, and they check that they're valid and that they're not being changed or subverted. And then we have MLD. Snooping. Now, MLD snooping isn't strictly a security mechanism, but it does protect your LAN from multicast flooding attacks. And it's easy, some people think that V6 is better than V4 in terms of security because there's no broadcast. Well, we have multicast. Yeah? And we have things like multicast groups 
to all nodes or to all routers. So it is better, but it gets even better if you take preventative measures such as MLD snooping. However, do you remember I talked about extension headers? That functionality, RA guard, DHCP v6 shield, neighbor discovery inspection, generally implemented in hardware because you want it to be fast in your LAN infrastructure. As soon as you add in extension headers, they don't have to be ones that you actually need, you just add them for the fun of it, um, your attacker can hide the attack, such as a fake router advertisement. In the original standards, there was no limit on the chain of extension headers. So what you could do was push the attack right off the end of the MTU, of the end of the frame, of the datagram into the next datagram and enforce fragmentation. Now, these will break those things, RA guard and so on. The good news is that there are recent standards that address these very issues and these will be talked about later, I think. But you as security professionals need to understand those protections and deploy them. So, I hope that's given you a fear, a fear, Did I do <laughs> a feel <laughs> for the things that you need to think about. What about the future? Well, the future is going to be IPv6 only networks. We have clients today that have built v6 only networks or, yeah, parts of their networks that are v6 only. This is the one thing that will improve things for you. Today, you've got dual stacks, whether you're using v6 or not. But in the future, you can get rid of v4 in its entirety and get rid of all the transition mechanisms too. So, where does that leave us? IPv4-only networks are historic. They don't exist. They've gone. So you should already have done IPv6 security, maybe 15 years ago. So what you probably need is a time machine, and we can go backwards <laughs> to maybe 10 or 15 years ago and implement the IPv6 security that you need. IPv6 does expand the vulnerability surface, but that doesn't mean it's all bad, because a lot of the things we need to do are things we do in v4 already, or at least <laughs> we should be doing in v4 already, and some of those things... Um, are actually better than in IPv4. And I just mention again the legacy thinking thing because I've come across this so often that people think in IPv4 way, ways and that is one of the biggest risks that you face. Okay, thank you very much. I've saved you some time. I, that was shorter than I expected. I must have missed some slides out. <laughs> so we have time for some questions. Hello. Hi. So your house in the Highlands has a front door and presumably there's a, an address on it. Uh, no. Well, you, you, could send, you could send a letter to the front door. Oh, OK, yes, yes, yeah. you could, yes. But I, w I wouldn't be able to send a letter to your TV set, would I? No. <laughs> uh, so do you, do you think there's any, any scope for use of NAT with, with V6, or should it, should it go? No, I don't. Um, no. What, what you can do, I understand your concern, and the beauty of NAT, and it is a beauty, is it breaks that front door. So your attacker really can't get in. But what um, you can do that very effectively with firewalls. So you can create the same brokenness, if you like that kind of thing. Um, I, I shouldn't be facetious, but you know, you know what I mean. What I'm, I'm trying to make the point that you can get the same functionality with a firewall without the need for NAT. And the thing you have to remember, too, is that the only standardised NAT in IPv6 is network prefix translation, which Microsoft use in Azure 
um, and internally. And that does a one-to-one -one mapping, so it wouldn't address the very security concern that, that you're giving as an example, uh, because you still have a one-to-one -one internal address, external address mapping. So you're not actually breaking it in quite the same way that NAT 4.4 does. So no, I'm of the view that you don't need NAT in IPv6, with a very rare exception where maybe you are a large security vendor and you have a large lab and you have huge numbers of nodes in there that you want to keep protected away from the rest of the, the world and maybe something like that would be appropriate but I'm not that keen on the idea. Anybody here a fan of the idea? Oh, you are? I'm, I'm an app lover, self-confessed, because you know, I think of the, the point of view of the gentleman from BT at the front. Users will have problems with their IP6 connectivity and the first thing they'll do is try and resolve that issue is turn off the firewall. And they'll, they'll mean to fix it later on, they'll forget it because it's tea time and there's a good film on. And you're going to have a far worse problem because all these devices that at the moment are not addressable directly for the internet will become directly addressable. There will be no protection for them. You know, it's kind of going back 25 years, you know, 20 years ago when we were all on modems, everyone had an IP address hooked directly into the serial port of their computers. And back then it was worse because we were all running Windows 98 and you could get on 445 on the attack it, take the computer down really easily. Most computers are more secure now, but the network is no longer protecting them. We're now reliant on those computers at that point in time. And you're going to have a real nightmare with all these home networks where, they are, where the file has been turned off because it's easier. That's why I love NAT, because they can't do it. It's impossible. Because it's broken. Or they can, well, whatever. No, it kind of works. They can do what they need to do. They, they survive. They use the internet. They don't really have any complaints. Mm. It, and it works for them, but they can't turn it off in that way. Mm. They can't allow everything to anything. The worst they can do is allow everything to one particular IP address, that, DM, that DMZ setting that's usually on there. Yeah. Your, your point is very valid. You're absolutely right. But it doesn't, in my view, make it worth having NAT. What's the advantage to not having NAT to a home network? I can access machines from elsewhere. But you can now. You can set a translation. You can explicitly do that. Because you know what you're doing, but 99% of everyone else on this planet doesn't know what they're doing. Okay, I'll tell my mum to do that one as well. You know, there's more than just us in this room on the internet. But then they're not going to turn the firewall off Sorry, can we use microphones because it's... The discussion's being recorded, and it's only captured yeah. if there's a microphone. So, so what you're positing is the set of people who, on the one hand, want to do things complicated enough that they encounter problems which require them turning off firewalls and know how to turn firewalls off. But the intersection of those with the people who don't know what they're doing. Now, that's actually that's not your grandmother, right? Because your grandmother didn't turn the firewall off in the first place. That's, that's a narrow set basically of people who don't know what they're doing but have little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Well, yes, the extent to which it's our responsibility to protect those people is a separate question. Yeah, there's a gentleman behind you, or do you want to respond? Question first here, actually. Yeah. Um, <coughs> is this part of the NAT discussion? It's on, Go ahead. part, part yeah. on the NAT discussion. Um, there is one reason for NAT, or one advantage that NAT has in the context of um, dynamically assigned or not statically assigned addresses. Mm. If every yeah. couple of months I get a new IP prefix from my provider, if I don't use NAT, then if I configure my PC to talk to my IP laser printer, it doesn't find the laser printer anymore mm. if the prefix has changed, if I don't have DNS or anything like this at home. So I can use site local addresses, but then my machines suddenly have multiple interfaces, I can do this. I'm a network administrator. I'm not sure my grand can set up yeah. site local well, let's addresses just do a and quick... distinguish between them and so on. Yeah, I understand your point, and there's a valid point about multi-homing as well, in that NAT can, in certain scenarios, make that easier. But your point about renumbering, if you change. Let me ask, there are a number of IPv6 service providers here. How many of you give different prefixes to your clients on a regular basis? To the same client, we you do. BT. That's interesting, right? Why? So how do you get around that? Well, the, so what, first of all, that's the question: Why? Um, yeah, that's a good many, question. How many, how many routes do you think there's possible in IPv6 with slash 56s? 
And how much is memory? Memory is actually much more expensive this week than it was last week. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. How do you manage that? those routing updates across your entire network um, and actually introduce a whole bunch of other challenges? And I found it one of the, the, the biggest um, static IP address internet platforms in the world, and it was a freaking nightmare trying to keep it going, trust me. Um, so, and that was when memory was cheap and the IP address space was, was, was actually 10,000 routes. Um, the second part, I mean, I think the second part to this, Adrian, I have a lot of um, kind of sympathy for, or sympathy, that word, support for your point of view, but it's a fake point of view um, to some extent. Nat, I mean, if I was to turn off Nat on the BT customer base today, I'd dread to think what would happen. Um, it would be horrific, is, is my view. But actually, that allows people to have an excuse not to think about their own personal security. And I don't think in this world that's acceptable. I do think we have a generational issue. You know, um, and my mother um, is a, an avid iPad fan. If I bought her an iPad for Christmas and then she got a bill for overuse in the internet a week later or something, because it, we're making it easier for people to access this stuff. You know, we hand out these devices, but we actually don't also hand out the intelligence about how we op how we have to operate and behave. So, you know, I say to my mum, don't leave your iPad lying around. It's like your handbag. It's got, uh, you know, important data on it. And I think it's all about education. So, you know, I think if anyone doesn't feel that's valuable um, today, let me tell you, it absolutely is. And, and it's probably keeping more of us safe and secure than you might like to believe. But the future is probably not that. And, and from my point of view, you know, we, we need to do much more on ensuring that as, as we um, build things, as we create products and services, that we think security in the middle of it rather than on the edge of it. And, and that's, a, that's something that's going to take us some time to do. Probably, you know, I, I would guess maybe as, as long as 10 to 15 years because there's so many things out there that people just randomly plug in. Thank you. Just quickly, Richard as well. Hey, so Richard from Sky here, and on the dynamic note you were talking about before, uh, so we get around that via, as you were saying, having ULA addressing on the LAN. Um, you don't necessarily need to combine that with a, with a V6 NAT um, in order to keep that local connectivity when the WAN side goes down. Regarding the NAT aspect of things, it's kind of a false sense of security. You're not, you're not getting the benefit from the, the lack of um, connectivity, you're getting it from the V4 firewall that's intrinsically linked with the NAT 4.4 currently. So I think, as Neil mentioned, the, the model was going to be shifting quite a lot to uh, keeping the firewalling on that traditional NAT gateway, moving it also to the end devices as well. The responsibility is now going to be on the end hosts more than necessarily the intermediary systems in the middle. Any more on, on, on that? Now, I don't think There's we're going to make... one down at the you front right been. there. <laughs> or two down at the front right, in fact. Yeah, actually, I, I was going to make a point on the net for four kind of furling, where people tend to forget the uh, universal plug-and-play, plug and yeah. UPnP, <laughs> which is a huge... It's basically saying, I have a net at home, and your security camera that you bought to see if your grandma hasn't fall the stairs, is opening port 8020 yeah. to the internet, and it's, you, your grandmother is on shutdown now, and everybody in Russia is watching her. Yeah. So uh, with V6, this will still be a problem? Yeah, fine. But at least my Skype communication with my relatives in elsewhere won't be having to traverse all the way to America and creating other problems for myself. Mm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now is not without its own security problems and not without, as you said, a firewall. Yeah. So you've discussed, you've discussed a lot about what's wrong with it. I was just interested, interested to understand things like TR69, are suppliers rolling that out and including these extensions to V6, which will make edge security better and easier for providers? Well, I think the providers can answer that. And my understanding from people I've talked to is the answer is yes. Um, do you have any? Yeah, they're nodding, or at least some are nodding, <laughs> um, but yes, that, that's my understanding. And the providers and manufacturers that I've spoken to, that is the standard. So standards are being agreed. And exactly. Yeah. And that, for those who don't know, that 
provides security, is a specification that includes security for um, CPEs that provides you equivalent or better than what you get with NAT. And that was the aim of it. Um, it's up to you whether you take your pick, whether you believe that or not. Um, I'm happy to do so. Um, it's all very well to push more of, sorry, push more of the security onto the end devices, but that assumes that the end devices are capable of running the security algorithms. Yep. And I'm thinking of IoT devices, yep. which don't have the power, or power computationally or mm. electrically to, to run the, these um, uh, encryp encryption, for example. Yeah. And you know, that, that's yeah. a worry. You're, you're absolutely right, and Dave referred to this. IoT environments um, are designed typically to have a gateway or the edge routers where that security is held. Yes, there's security within IoT, so you do have security standards for 6 low pan and so on that include security that for limited devices, but it pushes the big things to the edge of the IoT networks. You're absolutely right. That is a problem. You need to make sure that edge is secure. Thank you. Any? In IoT, there is another potential problem. You may well want to have uh, the same interface used by a number of different providers for different purposes, using different prefixes, since they'd like to use the prefix which they are used to for their whole customer base. Does this cause extra problems? I would imagine it causes extra problems throughout the routing structure and everything else. It certainly does. You're absolutely right. And I alluded to this earlier, but I didn't actually explicitly say, and that is with IPv6, and it applies to IoT and where you've got multiple providers, um, say mobile IoT using mobile networks, you can end up with multiple prefixes, not just multiple addresses within the same prefix. You can end up with networks that are multi-numbered, multi-homed with multiple addresses. And, and you're right, it does have huge implications. You have to duplicate your firewall rules for everything and your ACLs. Is that what you meant? I yes. think it is, yeah, yeah. There's a lady down here, Tim. Hi, thanks for that. It just seems that there's a missing uh, group audience which is um, people who have, um, using Linode or um, uh, DigitalOcean, and they're currently connecting, SSHing in via IPv4. Mm. And it would be good to have a quick overview for th all those folk to say, OK, you currently are running your mail server on your uh, Ubuntu, um, logging in via IPv4. Here's, how you would, here's why and how you would switch to SSHing by IPv6. Like, no one sort of addresses that core group of individuals. It's all very much big company oriented. Mm. But um, yeah, just a suggestion. Yeah, thank you. I think there's actually quite a lot of things we could have added in. But, uh... okay. Any more questions? Oh, there is the hand. Okay. I'm Again, on the wrong side of the room. <laughs> You're giving a challenge to Veronica, though. 10,000 steps, 10,000 steps before lunch. <laughs> so uh, you talked about the various switch protection mechanisms, like RA yep. guard and all that sort of yep. thing. And then, then you kind of went on to say, actually, they all become useless because you can just shove a million extension <laughs> headers on there and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, Pending uh, the development of something that can guard against that, what can what can we do with today's switching hardware to? Well, I, 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 this is going to be answered later in another talk by Fernando. So I would love to steal his thunder, but I won't. I'll, are you happy okay. to wait yeah, until yeah, I'm, I'm he right deals with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. 